hello again and I know it's uh, pretty much summertime in most parts of the US but not here <laughs> I'm up at Mount St. Helens with my friend Darren and we came out hopefully to do some Milky Way photography there's still snow on all the hills around us and the mountains got a good bit of it on it as well I mentioned in my last video from Bryce uh, Canyon National Park that astrophotography is hard and it really really is there is a lot of, of trial and error and even when you know what you're doing it's still kind of a dice roll because you are so dependent on not only the weather but just accurately focusing your camera in pitch blackness which is really difficult and second guessing yourself and then shutter speeds and noise shooting at high isos um, it's it's just hard to come away with a really in focus clean image with a foreground or a subject with the milky way soaring overhead there are a ton of videos on youtube that talk about uh, milky way photography and there are many many ways to do it and i don't think um, there's any one way that is the only way um, and there's the 500 rule when it comes to your shutter speed and your aperture and the lenses that you need and how to focus in the dark and how to set up and there and then once you get done do you do you um, how do you mitigate the noise as best as possible what do you do uh, do you stack your photos do you take a bunch and use special software do you use Photoshop Do you use just Lightroom do you do a separate exposure for the foreground and then separate ones for the Milky Way there's a lot of ways to do it so uh, again I'm not going to tell you that my way is the best way but I'm going to share with you the way that I approach it and all the settings and how I'm going to hopefully come away with a shot tonight While we're waiting let's just talk about the basic settings you're going to start off with your camera to do any type of astrophotography so number one you're going to want a camera that has a very fast aperture meaning a very open aperture so we're looking at minimums of f 2.8 or faster some primes some people shoot um, astrophotography with prime lenses Darren I think has a 20 millimeter um, and so if you can get a faster uh, aperture or piece of glass that's going to help you out a bit because you're going to be shooting wide open because you need as much light to get in to your sensor as fast as possible so that's your first piece of the puzzle is your aperture So the next two pieces are really closely intertwined we're talking about your focal length that you want to use as well as your shutter speed so your focal length you're going to want it wide sit for two reasons number one the Milky Way is really long so you want to be able to capture a lot of it and then number two you want it really wide because the wider your angle of your lens the longer you can keep your shutter open before those stars start to trail if you're zoomed in at like 50 millimeters or even 24 or 30 millimeters your, your shutter speed is going to be so so short that you're not going to be able to get enough light in on your on your sensor to produce anything it's just going to come out pitch black it's just not going to work so you want to be wide as you possibly can so most people when they're shooting astro are shooting between 12 millimeters 14 16 20 and if, if you get to 20 or above you're usually usually you're going to be shooting with um, a prime that has an aperture of like 1.4 1.2 something like that in order to allow you to get more light to keep that shutter speed shorter we're talking about how long you can keep your shutter open before those stars start to trail and it depends like I say on your focal length there used to be a thing called the 500 rule where you could divide your focal length into 500 and that number would tell you how many seconds you could leave your shutter open before the stars would trail well that is just it, it just doesn't work anymore especially with modern cameras 
It was probably never that great to begin with. Under those rules, a 16 millimeter should be able to go about 30 seconds before trails appear. And I can tell you for a fact that if you're at 20 seconds, they start to trail too much for me. The app PhotoPills, which is a app that's available on uh, for I, iOS devices, and I believe it's most likely available for Android, I'm not sure, that has a, very, a much more accurate shutter speed calculator for stars, for pinpoint stars. And for 16 millimeters, you're looking at about, I want to say it's, it's like 8 seconds. It's 16 millimeters. And after 8 seconds, the pinpoint stops being a pinpoint. And at 24 millimeters, you're down to like 6, four, 4 to 5 seconds. Um, which is which is not a lot of time to get light on that sensor. So those ISOs are going to have to go really, really high if you're using that, if you want those pinpoint stars. There are a couple of ways to focus at night. The easiest way, if you've got the patience and the time, is to fo set up your camera, get your composition set, focus, and then put your, your lens in manual focus mode. And then don't touch it until you're done and you pack up your camera. That will work. If you get there and it's already dark, you have a couple of other options that you can try. And one of those is if you've got, you're by yourself and you're not going to interfere with other photographers. If you have a flashlight, you can take and illuminate something far away to, to focus on. So, and then do the same thing, put it on manual focus. Uh, check to make sure everything looks good after you've done that because you want to make sure you have enough depth of field that you focus far enough away so that everything from from that point to you know all the way away is in focus all the way to infinity the last way is you can find a bright star in the sky and using manual focus on your camera you can zoom in um, using live view if you've got an older camera or on the mirrorless or all live view you zoom in and then on the back of that screen you turn your focus ring and you want to make those stars a pinpoint make the star as small of a dot as possible if it's blurry it's going to get bigger and it's going to kind of bloom and as it gets more and more focused it's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller the problem with that that i've discovered a while back is that if you're having to, if the star isn't that bright and you're having to crank your ISO really, really high, the noise on the back of the screen can make it impossible to see that little bitty pinpoint star and get up and get it to much less to be able to see it over all the noise that's happening on the back of the camera. There's a little bit of light left, and I, I've got other photographers besides Darren here tonight, so uh, vlogging when it's pitch black turning on a light is not cool because it that when it's really really dark like it is up here at Mount St. Helens it's not cool to be turning on a flashlight trying to fumble around with your camera um, I do have a headlamp that has a red LED light on it that helps but still you have to be very 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 careful uh, with it so that you're not interfering with other photographer shots so that's a good etiquette point you need to know your camera well enough to operate it in the dark and you also should have a little headlamp or something that has a red light on it so that you don't ruin your um, your night vision and you can kind of shield it and turn it on if you really really have to to be able to see something but once it starts getting much darker, I'm not really going to be vlogging much. I'm just going to be waiting for that Milky Way to come out, and then you'll get to see the shot. I've already got my focus set. I've got my, um, my aperture set at 2.8. I'm at 20 millimeters. I've already focused my camera. I've turned it, into man turned it into manual focus mode like we talked. The only thing I have left to do is start adjusting that ISO and that shutter speed. Once my shutter speed hits 30, I mean 6 seconds, I'm going to have to start that uh, ISO ramp up. Now, um, I'm taking shots as it gets darker. And the reason I'm doing that is to keep my foreground in Mount St. Helens noise-free as possible. And the way to do that is 
like I say right now, is take those shots at twilight after the sun has set as it gets darker and darker and darker. Keep taking a shot, one shot every like 10 minutes or so. Then um, I won't have to worry about a noisy foreground or Mount St. Helens uh, at all. I'll be able to use that noise-free mountain with my Milky Way. Um, some people do it all in one shot. That's another option. If you don't want to do this, you just wait till the Milky Way comes out and you shoot it all. And then um, you have noise to deal with in your foreground as well as the Milky Way. Because again, those ISOs are going to be pretty, pretty high. And again, I don't know what ISO I will end up at. Uh, I'm probably going to go around 3,200, 5,000, somewhere around in there. I don't want to go too much higher than that. I'd almost rather stop at 3,200 and then just boost the exposure in post-processing if I have to do that. I'm back in the office from Mount St. Helens and I wanted to take the time now to give you a overview of how I process my Milky Way photographs. I'm not going to give you a step-by-step. -step. That would require a lot of time, and this video is already starting to run a bit long. But I wanted to complete it by at least showing you the frames that I chose and how I combined them, in, like I say, in, a, uh, in an overview to come up with the final image that I'll get to show you at the end of the video. So here we are in Lightroom. I did my foreground different than I described in the video. I did take those shots as the sunset, but as it got really, really dark, I wanted to make sure that I had a more believable image, and I wanted to do that by taking a photograph of it right before I did all the Milky Way shots. So in order to keep the noise down to a bare minimum, what I did was I simply uh, dropped my ISO to like ISO 400, then I kept it at f2.8, but I just did an exposure of, uh, it was 256 seconds. That enabled me to have a, an exact same exposure as I was exposing for the Milky Way and to keep that noise to a bare minimum in my foreground and Mount St. Helens. So this first photograph is of the foreground. You'll notice f2.8, ISO 400, and if I zoom in at 100%, you'll see all these star trails, which is the thing that we don't want when we're shooting the Milky Way. We want those to be pinpoint sharp. But if you take a look at Mount St. Helens and my foreground, I'll go ahead and bump these shadows up just to show you. Um, it looks really nice. It's not a lot of noise at all compared to what I would have had if I would have shot it at the ISOs that I was having to shoot the Milky Way. So this is my base photograph for my foreground. Here are my photos of the Milky Way. And I use a program for the PC, I'm a PC user, and I use a program called Sequator. That's S-E-Q-U-A-T-O-R. You can download it, it's absolutely free. And what it does is it allows you to stack multiple images of your night sky together and then it will align those images because the Milky Way is moving. Remember, I'm, even though I'm only doing a uh, you know, six to 10 second exposure, that Milky Way is constantly moving. So uh, it allows you to take those multiple images of the Milky Way, stacks them together, aligns them, and it uses a process to help reduce the noise. And it does a really, really good job. If you are a Mac user, there's a very similar program. It's very, very similar. It's almost identical. It's called uh, it's called Starry Landscape Stacker. That one is not free. It is $39.99. If you're going to be doing any astrophotography, I highly recommend you get a hold of that because it will really, really help in you to create a much, much cleaner image. I decided to use 10 images for sequitur. You don't want to use too many, too little, it's not going to help that much. Too many just becomes overkill. So I think a good number of, of, Mil of Milky Way images to use uh, in sequitur to eliminate, as, you know, get a cleaner image is somewhere between seven and 12, seven to 10, something like that. So I did 10 and I used the ones at the, end of, at the end of the night, the very last shots that I took, simply because that's when the Milky Way got to the right position over Mount St. Helens that I was really looking for. 
then th those are the ones I went to immediately. After I did my basic edits, white balance, you know, a little bit of contrast adjustments, some local adjustments, again, focusing strictly on the Milky Way, not even remotely caring about what the foreground looks like because the foreground I'm going to use from that other image. Once I did that, I selected the first one. Then I held my shift key down and went to uh, the last one. And then I did a sync. And I said, you know, check all. And I basically synchronized it across all the images, all the changes I made to that one image. Now I'm ready to take these and put them into Sequitor. Now Sequitor well, uh, uses TIFFs, uncompressed TIFFs. That's your best bet to get the best result. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to right click on our images and we're going to tell it to export and we are going to tell it to a specific folder. We'll go to here and Milky Way TIFFs for stacking. Select that folder. Then we'll go in and we'll rename these to Milky Way Stacks. There we go. And we want to make sure that we are saving these as a TIFF and no compression, 16 bits. Color space, Profoto RGB or sRGB, that's not that important if you're not going to be printing. Uh, no resize, you want it full size, full size uh, photographs. And no watermarks or anything else. Then you're going to say show and explore after you're done. So then you'll click export and when you're done. So once I've exported my TIFF files, I'm ready to put them into Sequitor. So here are my 10 TIFFs. And I will go into Sequitor. I've already kind of preloaded this up just to kind of speed things up a little bit. But here are my star images. And you would right click on star images and say add. When that add comes up, you'll select the photos, the TIFF files that we just exported. You would click open. That'll put them into the stack, which is right here. You'll have a base image, and it doesn't really matter. Pick one in the middle because that's the one that where the Milky Way isn't too far one way or the other. And it will usually just pick that middle one for you. Uh, if you've done noise images or vignetting images, I don't do that. Again, it gets really complicated really, really quick. So the last thing we want to do here uh, in this little part of it is we want to choose an output file. We right click on that and say save as, and it's going to open up the same folder. And what we're going to do is just, I named it stacked TIFF. It's going to save it as a TIFF when it's done. Then we're going to go down here to our options and the composition is we right click on it or click on it. And it's going to give us uh, two options, align stars or trails. We want to align the stars. We want pinpoint stars. The next thing is, uh, do we want to freeze the ground? Obviously we do. We want a uh, foreground that is frozen. It doesn't matter. If you're shooting up at the sky, there's no foreground and all you have is our stars, then you don't have to worry about it. But since I want to keep that ground at the same place and I want to move the stars all together, I want to have freeze ground. It'll automatically come up and have selective. Um, then you're going to have to go down to the sky region. And since we've done freeze ground, we need to kind of help it out a little bit. So it's going to want us to do, um, to identify what is the sky. And that's going to be in a regular mask. It says fill the sky with brush. So as we move our mouse over here, we'll see the brush and we can use our mouse wheel to get it really big. And as we paint, we're identifying the sky region. Now we don't have to be, um, absolutely flawless with this when we get close to the uh, horizon, but we want to do definitely do a, our due diligence and make it uh, as close as we can get. And so we're going to do this. And as you can see, I'm painting uh, the sky region doing is getting it a little close, but I'm not going to worry about all this, you know, the minutia. I'm not going to get, try to get it perfect. All right, I think that looks pretty good. Next thing we'll do is we're gonna click Start. And it's gonna do the processing. It's gonna load each TIFF, make the mask, and then it's gonna align all those images. Then when it's done, 
it will say completed successfully. And we will say close. And here is our stacked TIFF file. So here's the image, the stacked TIFF file in Photoshop. It's uh, not finished by any stretch, but I want to just show you how incredible it a job that Sequitor does in stacking and getting helping to mitigate all that ugly noise. So I'm going to zoom in to 100%. We'll get to the core of the Milky Way right in here. And just take a look here as I am going to turn the original. This is the original raw file right out of the camera or with the Lightroom edits, I should say. And I know even on the video, you're able to see that. That's the raw file. And that is the sequitur stacked file. Raw, not so great. And the sequitur stack file, a lot. It's, it's amazing. It does a great job. I can't recommend it enough just to keep things simple. It's free if you're a PC user. And if um, you're a Mac user, just use that starry landscape stacker. So now we've got our TIFF file and we've got our foreground file. All we have to do is merge all those together in Photoshop. So here is my, um, my workflow here. I've got my foreground, which came out fantastic. If you will zoom in at 100% on that. And you can take a look. Here's my foreground, nice and noise free, looks great taking it at exactly the same time as I took the Milky Way shots that are, that are merged with it and with the exact same settings and exposure. So the light and everything is going to be as realistic as it possibly could be. Then um, you can take a look through my, my Milky Way here, the shot. Again, uh, I, I did a little bit longer of an exposure than I was talking about because I was just worried about getting enough light on that sensor. If you take a look up here in the corners, because my uh, exposure, let's go back to Lightroom and take a quick look. My exposure here was 10 seconds. And remember I said anything after, um, I believe it was six seconds at 16 millimeters, it's gonna start to tic-tac, it's gonna start to trail. And I was, and I, it was like a little bit of wiggle room between six and like 12 seconds. And so I went to 10. And again, that's that whole thing. You're just, you're, you're second guessing yourself. I always do. <clears throat> and if you look, if we go here and we look in these corners, you'll notice like these stars right in here, you know, right in here. These are little Tic Tacs right in there. If you go towards the middle of the screen here, there are a lot more pinpoint. These are little dots. These look pretty, pretty good. And that's because with that wide angle lens, you're gonna start seeing those tic tacs and those trailing on the edges, all right? Before you're gonna see it in the center of your photograph. Now I can crop it down a little bit and help get rid of that, or I could have went with a shorter shutter speed, but I just wanna show you that um, it's ridiculous to think you can do 30 seconds on a 16 millimeter because you're seeing trailing in the edges. You can even up here in the right hand corner, um, upper right, you can see these little star trails are starting to tic-tac out. They're starting to get, um, it's ridiculous to think you're going to get 30 seconds uh, and, and not have this. And so I was at 10 seconds and managed to pull this off. Before I show you the final image, be sure to let me know in the comments below if you would like a more in-depth tutorial on how I process my Milky Way photos in Lightroom and Photoshop. Don't forget, if you're interested in any tutorials online, one-on-one -on -one teaching with Photoshop or Lightroom, or want to sign up for my mailing list to see what workshops I'll be hosting this year and into the future, check out my website at jamesparkerphoto.com. Don't forget, like and subscribe. I really appreciate it, and it helps my channel grow. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.